Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, everybody. This is Marshall Poe. I'm the editor of the New Books Network, and this is an episode in the Princeton University Press Ideas podcast. And today, we are very fortunate to have Marion Turner on the show, and we will be talking with her about her book, Chaucer, A European Life, which came out from Princeton in 2019. Marion, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. My pleasure. Could you begin the interview by telling us a little bit about yourself? Sure. My name is Professor Marion Turner. I'm a professor of English literature um, at the University of Oxford, where I'm a tutorial fellow at Jesus College. So I teach literature from the kind of 7th century through to the 16th. Um, and I research all kinds of things to do with the late medieval, particularly Chaucer. Uh, you have to cover a lot of centuries compared to your colleagues. <laughs> yeah, well, I do. And I actually also stray into the modern because I also teach courses on life writing since I became a biographer writing this book. Um, so I actually teach kind of every century in a way. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's a lot. That is a lot. Well, good on you. Um, could you tell us why you wrote this book? Well, I suppose I thought that there were a lot of stories that needed to be told about Chaucer and stories that hadn't been told. And on the contrary, there's a lot of there's a lot of misconceptions that people have about Chaucer, about medieval literature. And I wanted to put some of those right. So Chaucer, first of all, had a completely fascinating life. And I think a lot of people just don't know that, that this was a man who was a prisoner of war, who traveled all over France and Italy and Spain, who had all kinds of interesting jobs, worked for the king, um, saw the Peasants' Revolt happening in London, invented the iambic pentameter, did so many things and was such an experimental, interesting guy. But people tend to think of him in somewhat staid terms. And one of the things that I really wanted to do was to unpick the idea of Chaucer as the father of English literature, which I think has a real hold on people's idea of Chaucer. And it's an idea, this sense of the father of English literature, it makes people think of him as patriarchal, as conventional, and as, of course, English. And so I wanted both to look at the idea of him as patriarchal, the father of the canon, and demonstrate the fact that, in fact, he was very interested in the new, in experiment, in debunking ideas of authority and authoritative voices. And then also, I mean, you can see that the the subtitle of my book is A European Life. So I wanted to interrogate that idea of Englishness and to reestablish Chaucer not as the the head of the English canon, but as a great European poet, as someone who travelled widely and who was influenced by all kinds of cultural streams that came, in fact, from all over the world, but particularly from Europe, and to help people to think about him as someone that was expansive in his interests, and therefore to help people to think about literature in English and English culture as something that is fundamentally European transnational, global, not as insular, limited, nationalistic. I'm I'm glad you mentioned travel because I think many people have the misconception that people in the medieval period or late medieval period did not travel a lot, or even in the early modern period. I remember seeing a diagram or a map of the places that Thomas Hobbes went, and he went everywhere, all Mm -hmm. over Europe. And he was, yeah, people think of him as an English philosopher. Well, not really, uh, because these people traveled a lot. And as we'll talk about in Chaucer's case, he traveled even um, more than your uh, sort of average. He was kind of a court functionary at a point. So we'll yeah. get into that. Um, this is a kind of uh, what we call in America inside baseball question. And that <laughs> means a question that is uh, specific to a particular field of interest. Could you tell us a little bit about the sources? of Chaucer's life. I've worked in the medieval period myself, and I know that sometimes they're quite thin, but I'd be interested to hear how we know what we know about Chaucer. Yeah, so we actually know a huge amount about Chaucer. So if you compare what we know about Chaucer to what we know about Shakespeare, there really is no comparison. We know so much more about Chaucer, even though he, of course, lived a couple of hundred years earlier. And the main reason for that is that he was a civil servant. 
and the English are very good at bureaucracy. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> so there's a huge amount of records. There's a volume called the Chaucer Life Records, which has around 500 separate documents, which all refer specifically to aspects of Chaucer's life. These documents, though, they are not private diaries or letters, um, and none of them has anything at all to do with the fact that he was a poet. As far as we know, he was never paid anything for his poetry. So these documents are, I mean, many of them are things that might first of all seem to be quite dry documents. But in fact, what I found was when you when you dig into them, when you expand them, you can do all kinds of things with them. So, so lots of these records are things like the fact that he is paid for doing something, for example, you know, or he appears in a list of people who are all getting given livery when a member of the royal family dies. It's, it's those kinds of documents. It's not, you know, a personal letter from his son to him or, or, or anything like that. But some of these records, as I say, so one of the things that I did was I would look at some of these records as starting points, and then I might put them back into their original context. So rather than seeing them in the context of a volume of Chaucer life records, I would take the document that, for instance, tells us that Chaucer was given a safe conduct in Navarre and in Spain, modern Spain, but then it was a separate separate kingdom, Navarre. And I would then look at all the other documents from the Chancellery of Navarre that were issued in the same week to try to see what was going on when he was there. Who was this? Who was it who was giving him the safe conduct? Who else was at the court at that time? And I went to Navarre physically, went to that to the actual palace where that safe conduct was issued, looked at the streets around it, saw where the Street of the Jews was, saw what kind of architecture was there, and tried to expand that that mm. very small document into something much richer, which could really tell us all kinds of things about his life. Or another example would be the earliest Chaucer life record, um, which just tells us that he, as a teenager, when he was working as a page, was given um, clothes by his employer. So his employer was um, a countess, Elizabeth de Burr, who was married to the son of the king, Lionel. Um, and everyone has known about this document. As I say, it's the earliest Chaucer life record says that she brought in these clothes. So then I, I looked into the clothes. It was the, the item, the main item was called a pole top. And so I looked into fashion history. I looked into contemporary chronicles. I tried to find out what exactly this pole top was and what people were, were saying about the, the pole top. And I found out this was a completely fascinating item of clothing, that this was, in fact, something which was scandalous at the time. It was high fashion. It was brand new at the time that Chaucer was given it. Um, and that very shortly afterwards, conservative, um, ecclesiastical, often um, chroniclers were saying that this garment was so scandalous because it was short and tight and it made it allowed people to see men's genitals kind of outlined very provocatively. So chroniclers were saying at the time that it was such an outrageous item of fashion that it had actually caused the plague to return to England, that <laughs> God had sent the plague as a punishment. This is the, the second wave of the plague in the, in the 1360s, that God had sent the plague as a punishment for allowing these young men to dress in this way. So this turned out to be an incredibly rich document you know, that initially seems quite throwaway, quite minor, but you find out all kinds of things. And and that was also, I think, uh, I mean, this is a, I mean, a lot of people really found that that anecdote, I think, very interesting in the book. It's in the in the second chapter, in, in the chapter about the household. And I think one of the things that people found interesting about it was this sense of Im immediate um, accessibility, um, the sense of relevance with the present day. You know, the idea that, oh, look, back in the 14th century, just like today, people are saying to their to teenagers, oh, you can't go out dressed like that. And what do you think you're doing showing off your body in that way? And with even more you know, specific relevance to our, our particular moment right now, People are also saying, oh, it's those young people. They caused the plague. You know, I mean, just like we've seen lots of, um, <laughs> lots of discussion about, you know, oh, look at young people socialising, spreading COVID. So you get this sense of, of the things that don't change. But the other thing that, um, that I think is really important about this, this anecdote and about thinking about the past in general is not only this sense of relevance and accessibility, which is absolutely there, but also the absolute otherness, because... These were not fashions that the young Jeffrey chose to wear. He worked in a job 
in which he was not paid a salary. He was paid in a place to sleep and food and clothes and a kind of education in manners and in other kinds of cultural um, pursuits. He didn't choose these clothes. The great lady for whom he he worked bought him these clothes because she wanted the people in her retinue, the people who were you know, sitting around in her hall to look fashionable because that would reflect well on her. So he was not, Chaucer at this time, you know, unlike teenagers in, you know, privileged teenagers anyway today, Chaucer was not able to have much of a private life. You know, he wasn't, he didn't have a room of his own. He wasn't able to craft his own identity in the way that most teenagers would feel was very important today. He wasn't able to choose his own style, his own fashion, where he slept, what he ate, anything like that. He had to live in a much, much more public way. So I think that's just a really, really important reminder to us when we're thinking about the past to think not only about what is familiar, but also to make these really difficult leaps of the imagination and really try to think about what it meant to live in in a very different way with different standards and different ideas about what it meant to be a person, to be an individual. And at that point in his life, we'll come to this in a second, but he was what we would call in service. So he really wasn't his own person. Yeah, he was in service, but not in the way that we would think of a domestic servant, because this was a right. privileged position. So this was a position that only a very lucky young man would have. You know, he was not, so he was a page boy. He was not, you know, in the kitchens, um, kind of slaving away all day. He would mainly have been, you know, running errands and um, getting, and being treated as a kind, almost like a, a son of the house. I mean, not quite as much as that. He still had to do what he was told, but he was getting an education, making connections, doing those kinds of things. And as I say, being a kind of ornamental figure as well, he would have been you know, doing things like, like music and poetry and um, sword fighting and, and those kinds of things, um, not you know, slaving away, carrying buckets of water up the stairs or anything like that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So could you tell us a little bit about Chaucer's background in early life before he ends up wearing this Garb, the name of which I have forgotten, yeah. but I'm going to Google. Pre-Portok <laughs> days. Um, yeah. So Chaucer was born in the early 1340s in London. Um, he was born and lived in Vintry Ward. So medieval London, uh, modern London, in fact, was divided into wards, so different areas of the city. So Vintry Ward, as you can tell from its name, was named after the vintners, um, so wine merchants. Of course, other people lived there as well, but it was known for the wine trade. And Chaucer's father was a wealthy wine merchant who traveled to France um, to to get wines to sell. So Chaucer was from a well-off background, not an aristocratic background, but a well-off mercantile background. Vintry Ward um, was one of the wards which was right on the north bank of the River Thames. So it's on the river. So if you're in Vintry Ward, you are seeing ships coming in and going out every day, ships that were bringing products from all over the world, from as far afield as Indonesia at this time. Um, of course, the ships didn't come directly from Indonesia. There'd be many middlemen, but products were coming from, from that far. And Vintry Ward was the ward of London that had more immigrants in it than any other ward of London. So Chaucer grew up meeting people who came from lots of different countries and hearing lots of different languages. I mean, all educated men at this time were trilingual, um, English, French and Latin in England. Um, But he heard other languages as well and learnt languages such as Italian. He was brought up in Vintry Ward. He may also have spent some time in Southampton when his father got a job there for a bit. And his father had positions um, for the royal household as well, provisioning some of the king's residences with wine. So he had royal connections, which may have helped Chaucer to get a leg up um, when he himself um, got a job later in life. We don't know much about his early life. We have to speculate a certain amount about what he would have what he would have done. So we don't know which school he went to, but he certainly went to school, went to a grammar school in London. um, And there are various possibilities. And he would have been schooled in Latin very much. learned all kinds of skills there and in in London he would have experienced you know the drama of London streets the 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 excitement of living in a big city 
not very big by today's standards, but big compared to the the hamlets um, that most people lived in at, at that time. So we had a cosmopolitan early existence and an early existence that was rooted in multilingualism and a world in which it was normal for people to travel around, um, to travel abroad, as his father did, and also a world which had some connections to the court, to the highest people in the land, without by any means being of the court. Yeah, this is a great segue to my next question. He was not an aristocrat. He was not a noble or a peer. How did he make it into the circle of the court? Well, we don't know exactly how he got his lucky break, but it was probably through his father's connection because his father worked as what was known as a a deputy butler to the king, which didn't mean he was a butler in a modern sense, but that he provisioned some of the king's residences with, with wines and so on. So probably that was how Chaucer got his first posting as a page. He then went on being attached to various um, royal households for most of the rest of his life. I think he must have done well once he arrived. It must have been clear that this was someone of exceptional intelligence and ability. So in his early years, when he was a page, he was working for Elizabeth, the Countess of Ulster, and very soon afterwards for her husband as well, Lionel of Antwerp. And because of the nature of the great household, when that household went to war, he went to war with them. So when the war with France was renewed, he went and fought with the king's sons and the king in in France um, in in 1359 and 60. And he he was captured, he was taken prisoner, he was ransomed by the king. And then after that, he was employed doing things like taking letters um, when the when the peace discussions were happening after that that part of the Hundred Years' War. And later on in life, he had attachments to John of Gaunt's household and also to the king's household, so Edward III's household, and then later Richard II's household, and had a number of appointments. He was clearly a useful person. I think partly he had he clearly had very good language skills. He was also an able diplomat. So we often hear of him traveling to Europe on diplomatic missions. And I think that was partly because he was he was good at talking. You know, he obviously had a way with words, as we can see in his mm-hmm. amazing writings. And after after some of the, the the battles that he fought in in his early life, mostly he was not a fighter. Mostly he went he was sent on missions by the royal household in order to negotiate with people, negotiate war treaties or peace treaties or marriage treaties. You know, he was better at talking than fighting. And I think he was the fact that he knew Italian meant that he was sent on Italian trips because not very many people did know Italian. And I think this is an interesting example of his mercantile background probably working in his favour, but because he was brought up amongst Italian merchants, he knew Italian. And then because of this interesting position he had kind of straddling the worlds of the mercantile world and the court world, he was then in a position to be sent on courtly missions. So he was sent to Italy twice. But he also, while working for the royal household, was simply given more more quotidian roles as well. It wasn't all travelling around Europe and going to Milan and Pavia. You know, he also got his job as a, the customs officer, which he did for many years. And that was also a, a royal appointment, something that the king gave him to do, um, but involved essentially being an accountant. And he did, he always worked, you know, all through his life. He was doing paid work. And, you know, incredibly, almost, he was writing things like the Canterbury Tales, you know, largely in his spare time. Yes, I wanted to ask how he, well, two questions. One is, when did he start writing and why did he start writing? Well, I mean, those are really interesting questions. So we know that he was writing by the early 1370s. Um, I think he was certainly writing earlier than that as well. You know, you don't suddenly start writing and produce the the book of the Duchess as your your first ever attempt. Um, but that's but we know that he wrote that poem so after it, it was about someone's death. So he wrote it after her death. So he wrote it probably around 1370. So when he was maybe coming up to 30 in his late 20s, but he must have written things earlier. He may even have written things in French in his in his youth because it was much more normal for someone like him at the court to write in, in French, but we, we don't know. Um, and then 
he wrote an incredible amount after that. Of course, there are other things that did not survive, but even what we know survived, that, that has survived, we can see that he was someone who was absolutely driven to write. I think he was someone who had to write you know, in, in a way that you, you can't rationalise or explain. So I think that the amount that he wrote for, you know, for not for financial reward, you know, the amount that he wrote, I think, shows how passionate he was intellectually about writing. So I suppose a, a supplementary you know, question within your question is, is also not just why did he write, but why did he write the kinds of things that he wrote? Mm -hmm. Because it wasn't automatic that someone such as Chaucer would write in English or would write the range of poems that he wrote. And so I think, first of all, the fact that he chose to write in English, I mean, partly Chaucer was someone who was fascinated by experiment. You know, he always wanted to do experimental things. Now, of course, people have always written, had always written things in English. There was a long, unbroken tradition of literature in English, you know, going back to before Beowulf. Um, so it wasn't that that was entirely novel, but people hadn't written these kinds of texts in English. He was very much writing initially within a French tradition, writing what we call a dit amoureuse or a love narrative, the kinds of things that um, that French poets writing in French, people such as Machaut, um, Foissart, those people from France or from Hainaut, those kinds of poems have been always been written in French before. And Chaucer decided to try this in English, to see what he could do with this language. So I think partly he's challenging himself. He wants to do something innovative. He wants to do something different. And that sense of being experimental, of wanting to do new things in literature, really continues when he encounters the Italians. I think the, the influence of the great Italian poets is really fundamental to what Chaucer is doing. Even the very decision to write in English is in many ways an international, not a national decision, because he's following in the footsteps of people such mm -hmm. as Dante, who had declared that you could write great poetry in his Tuscan dialect. You, know, you didn't have to use Latin. You didn't have to use the authoritative language. You could use the vernacular. So Chaucer is following that European tradition and saying, well, OK, if the Italians can do it in Tuscan, well, why can't I try in my little vernacular why can't I see what English can do this this second cousin language you know this less important um little brother language can I try and see what it can do um and then once he actually once he had really read those Italian poets in in great detail so particularly Dante and Boccaccio that also radically changes the kinds of poems that he writes or and feels that he that he wants to write so he uses the Italians both for, for subject matter and also for style. So it's after he's read certain verse forms and line forms in Italian that he develops a whole range of different kinds of verse forms. So things like the, the seven line rhyme royal stanza, as well as line forms such as the, the 10 syllable five stress iambic pentameter, which is developed from an Italian um metrical form so he uses the italians to and does something different but is very much inspired by by them so i think he's he's driven by this desire to to innovate and we see that right across his writing life because he keeps on doing new things different things you know there is a really there really is a, an infinite variety in the kind of poetry that he writes he also writes some prose of course but it's mainly poetry and the variety is incredible i mean it, it's extraordinary to see a writer who can write you know, the bawdy, rude fablio tales and then can <laughs> translate Boethius's philosophy, can write a, a, a translation of the French Romance of the Rose, can write short lyric poems, can translate moral fables and saints' lives, can write dream visions, the long romance of Troilus and Crusade, the tale collection. There's just so much there. It's, it's, it's hard to believe that anyone could do so much. I, I don't. This may sound very odd, but I'm reminded of uh, Keith Richards listening to American blues music <laughs> and thinking, this is what I need to do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure people like that comparison. <laughs> <laughs> I have to do this. Um, but did he actually meet these Italian poets? And he could converse with them because he spoke Italian, right? 
Well, he did speak Italian, but he probably didn't meet them. No, so mm-hmm. I mean the I mean Dante was long dead. Um, he it, it's one of those tantalizing things because he nearly overlapped with with Petrarch. Um, in, when he went to when when Chaucer went to Lombardy, which is where Petrarch had been living, he nearly overlapped with Boccaccio. So, and he could have met Boccaccio. It's one of those things a lot of people like to imagine that he did, because Chaucer went to Florence not long before Boccaccio gave a series of lectures um, about Dante in Florence. It is conceivable that they met, but there is absolutely no evidence, unfortunately, yeah. that, that they yes. did. But he certainly it would be a good story, time. though. <laughs> it would be, yeah. Lots of people have written that as a kind of fictionalized story, but but probably when he was in Italy, he was able to pick up a lot of their manuscripts um, and to to pick up texts that no one else had read. You know, so that he is he's reading particularly things like the poetry of Boccaccio and prose of Boccaccio before anyone else in England has read has read those texts at all. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned manuscripts and you mentioned Beowulf. If I'm not incorrect, Beowulf survives in one manuscript. Is that right? Yes, yes, that is right. And even that manuscript was burnt and is and is and is flawed. Right. And so this leads to my question: For whom was he writing, and do we have a lot of manuscripts? This is obviously prior to the printing press. What do we know about the circulation of his manuscripts? Yes. So. I mean, we have a lot more manuscripts of Chaucer's texts than we do of of Old English um, poetic texts. So we have, um, I think, 80-something manuscripts of the Canterbury Tales, um, but none of them are from Chaucer's lifetime. So, you know, know, they they proliferated in the 15th century. So Chaucer had died in in 1400. Um, The two earliest manuscripts... I mean, it's possible that they were written in his last years, but probably just afterwards. But they're roughly contemporaneous with 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 Chaucer. Um, they're called the Hengwit Manuscripts and the Ellesmere Manuscripts. And lots of people think that even if Chaucer himself didn't have anything to do with them, that his son may have had something to do with them. And there's a there's a lot of discussion about whether the scribe of those manuscripts was in fact a scribe who had worked personally for Chaucer and therefore had a had a close understanding of Chaucer's intentions for the text. And those things are under debate. But in terms of your, your question about for whom was he writing? Um, well, we, we have various ways of thinking about this. So we know that some of his early readers were people who were somewhat like himself. So people, so some of his early readers were people who were kind of on the fringes of the court. So people who were, who worked for the court, who were members of the household, but were not aristocrats, you know. So when you look at the wills of people such as um, dukes and the highest aristocracy at this time, the books that they leave are not books in English. They tend to be, the fictional books tend to be books in French. But we do know that chamber knights, so people of a slightly lower level, but still you know, very privileged members of the court, um, that they were reading Chaucer's texts and you know, quoting from them. Someone such as Sir John Clambo, for instance, who wrote his own texts. Um, some, we also have references to merchants and city people reading his texts. So, one, so someone, for instance, a, a merchant used a manuscript of Troilus to pay a debt in the 1390s. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, so we have these, you know, these really interesting references to to people who were more of the city um, reading his texts and scribes. So scribes such as someone called Thomas Usk, who was actually executed in the 1380s. He was reading Troilus and Crusade very early because he wrote his own text that was that was based on that was very much influenced by Troilus. So we also think it's most well, I think it's very likely that he, he had a mixed audience of men and women. Um, in one of his one of his poems, that the prologue to the Legend of Good Women, he imagines giving the poem to the Queen, um, Queen Anne. Whether or not that actually happened, he's imagining an audience which includes women. And again, at the end of Troilus, he talks about his audience as as an audience which includes women. So I think he is very much trying to write for women as well as men. And writing in English makes it more likely that he can reach a slightly more diverse range of people. So. When you write, when in choosing to write in English, he's making it more likely that women can read his work, and also more likely that people of a slightly more mixed um, kind of class demographic can read his texts. Um, it's not the case that your average ploughman is sitting around reading *The Knight's Tale*, 
not at all. But it's also not the case that only very privileged members of the court are reading Chaucer's texts. I think it's um, almost certain that his texts, his, that the Canterbury Tales in particular, was performed, for instance, in the Tabard Inn, in the real Tabard Inn. Um, so Ch Chaucer sets the, the opening of the Canterbury Tales in the Tabard Inn in Southwark. This was a real pub and the, the, the person who ran it was Harry Bailey, as, as he is in the Canterbury Tales. So Chaucer fictionalises this in the Canterbury Tales. But I think that it, it is extremely likely that his text was read in that in situation, in a situation in which people are sitting around, drinking, eating and socialising. And of course, texts were very frequently read out loud at this time. In fact, even if you were reading on your own privately, you would most likely read the text out loud. You know, reading silently was quite a, a new thing that was coming in. But very often, if you had a text, you would be reading it out to a group of people. So many people would be accessing it at once. Um, there's, there's a lovely scene in Troilus and Crusade where the heroine Crusade is sitting um, with a group of her her ladies, and they one of them is reading out a romance text, and they are all listening and talking about it and singing and it's like a lovely kind of medieval book group image of of how people experience reading as something that was collaborative and something that prompted conversation and I think we can very much um, imagine that happening both in a courtly set kind of setting with some of Chaucer's poems and in the more um, the more accessible in pub kind of setting that is that is drawn for us in the Canterbury Tales. Uh, this question might be inside baseball as well, but I've done a little of this work. How are these manuscripts dated? Is this, did, are there watermarks at this time on paper or how, how do you do it? Um, so, I mean, most of them aren't on paper. They're on parchment. Okay. Um, although when paper comes in, it is marked, but, um, but more by handwriting. So that's the main uh -huh. way because handwriting changes. And so paleographers can, can mainly date through through the handwriting style also sometimes of course ownership that sometimes manuscripts you know we, we have records or people have written their names in when they owned them those those kinds of things as well but it's mainly done by by dating the handwriting i see yeah god bless the paleographers yeah. um, i remember taking paleography courses in graduate school uh the my 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 follow-up question is was it unusual for somebody in his position, he was a royal official and an important one, to embark on these kinds of literary ventures? Well, it wasn't, it was unusual to do it to the extent that he did it. And certainly it was extremely unusual to do it as well as he did it in that almost no one else before or since has ever written as well as, yeah. as Chaucer, perhaps no one. Um Writing poetry was something that was a, a, a fashionable thing to do at court. So there were lots of people. So when he was at court, a member of the royal household, you know, lots of people do were writing poetry, were experimenting with poetry. It was a kind of game that people would do um, of, of writing texts and um, exchanging poems. He had friends who wrote poems as well, and he would exchange exchange texts with them. In one of his short poems, he he talks about the fact that he's translating a poem by a friend of his, but his friend was writing in French, so it was much easier for him. He says, you know, rhyme in English has such scarcity. Like, it's much harder for me because English had fewer words at this time. But he's also, <laughs> of course, making it clear how great he is because he's nonetheless borrowing words, <laughs> making up new words, making his poems work. Um, so people did write poems in that courtly scenario and also increasingly at this time, people such as, I mean, it's the beginning of a trend where you get this kind of bureaucrat poets. So he's right at the beginning of that of that that movement where there's more and more people who are highly literate who are working as accountant, clerk, you know, minor officials who want to write poetry. So we see more of them going into the 15th century. And he's at, at the beginning of that of that kind of trend. But what's extremely unusual is the amount that he writes, the sheer volume and the the brilliance of it. And I, I do find it I still, you know, even after all these years thinking about these things, I still feel quite a thrill when I think about what it was like for him. You know, he worked in the daytime for many years. He was working on on the quayside in London, doing his accounts during the day and then trudging home to his flat. His flat was over Aldgate, so one of the gates of the City of London. In fact, the gate 
through which the rebels flowed in 1381 um, during the Great Revolt, sometimes known as the Peasants' Revolt. He would trudge home to that flat. He would sit there and presumably he would light his candles and he would set to work. You know, he would look at his, he must have had his own volumes of lots of texts. Um, even though books were expensive, he must have had his own volumes of all kinds of things, Boethius, Boccaccio and so on. And he set to work, you know, writing his poetry into the night, having spent the day um, at the office doing his accounts. And he imagines that scene for us in a poem called The House of Fame. Now, it's a fictional text, so we can't take this as straightforward autobiography, but it's also a poem about a guy called Jeffrey who works in accounts and is a poet. Um, so, you know, it's only a thinly veiled <laughs> avatar here. And this Jeffrey <laughs> works hard and then he trudges home and then he, so he, so he's, he's it's very self mocking. You know, Chaucer's always self mocking and creates all these personae and avatars in his poems who are a bit bumbling and awkward and, and a bit stupid often. And so he talks about this Jeffrey going home and says, you know, he just sits dumb as a stone, a dumb as a stone, looking at another book, you know, till fully dazzled is his look. You know, he's dazed, he can't think. And he's talking about the fact that he has writer's block because he's just going and sitting in his room and looking at his books all the time, desperately trying to get inspiration. And interestingly, in this poem, the guide figure, who is himself, and he's an eagle, and he's also um, quite mocked in, in, in various ways. His advice isn't necessarily right, you know, but what he says is, you know, your problem is that you're not going to your door where all your neighbours are. You know, you're not going and listening to their stories and talking to them. And so he says, you know, go and go and listen to your neighbours. You know, get get some inspiration from them instead of only looking at books. And it's interesting because this text is in many ways a, a precursor to the Canterbury Tales. And what we see in the Canterbury Tales is a text which is, on the one hand, incredibly erudite, based very much on all kinds of literary sources, but also puts forward the idea that the conceit that you should listen to ordinary people's stories, that you shouldn't just look at the classics and great books um, and great literary sources, but that it really in order to make your own literature, you need to listen to new things, to new sources, to new stories, to real people, to the story that a miller will tell, not only the story that a great poet will tell, and not only listen to the upper classes, but listen to ordinary voices too. Mm -hmm. I, I find all this fascinating. One of the questions that is often asked of artists and poets and writers is why they do what they do. And in this case, and in many other cases, the answer has not so much to do with their context, but I don't know how better to put it that they get carried away with the work. It becomes an end in itself. And I've, I mean, I felt this in my own life when I was writing books and articles that, you know, I just had a notion and then suddenly I was immersed and I didn't have a choice anymore. The text was writing me. I, I was mm. writing the text. Mm. And I, I, I think this is true of a lot of people who are kind of an artistic or writerly bent. So you talked a little bit about his inspiration. Um, now, clearly it was these Italians, but how did he get the idea of writing about common people? Was this a, an ordinary thing to do? No. So this is a really, really unusual thing to do. Um, and I think the the fact that it is so unusual is really important in trying to understand Chaucer's, really his his brilliance. So the idea of a tale collection that's not a new idea. There's lots of, of other of other texts that do that. So where you 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 have a, a way of gathering together lots of different stories, right, within a, an overarching frame. And one of his sources is Boccaccio's Decameron. So in the Decameron, ten people get together. In fact, they're escaping the plague. Um, ten mm -hmm. people get together, and for ten days they each tell a story. So you end up with ten days of ten tales, a hundred altogether. So it's very um, perfectly formed. And the key thing about the tale telling group is that they are all essentially identical. So when they're described, I mean, they are a, they're a gender mix, but when they're described, they're described as all beautiful, upper class, refined, they're related to each other and close friends. They are socially identical. So that model is then completely um, turned on its head. You know, Chaucer does something completely different when he decides to gather together this crew of people who are very much varied in terms of social class. So from the highest one, well, from high, I mean, he doesn't actually have the really highest in society. The highest person he has is a knight. Um, 
And he only has one plowman figure who doesn't get to tell a tale. So it's more about all the in-between kind of people, the emergent social classes. You know, so there's a lawyer, there's a merchant, um, there's a friar, there's a pardoner, there's a cook. There's, you know, all kinds of middling people. It's quite an urban group in many ways. Lots of the kinds of people that were migrating to cities and taking their chances there, particularly in the post-plague years. So um, I think that in literature at this time, there are examples of descriptions of people of different social classes. So in a, in a genre called estate satire, for example, where people from different kinds of classes were um, described and their faults were kind of mocked and, and satirized. But no one had done anything like like the Canterbury Tales before. I mean, it was it was an idea that came from Chaucer, the idea of taking these people of different social classes and saying, OK, I'm going to put, I'm going to juxtapose a knight's tale with a miller's tale. I'm going to have interruption and juxtaposition at the heart of my poetics, which is what Chaucer does. So he refuses to have the tales told in order of hierarchy or order. You know, the knight tells the first tale, the host then wants the next highest person of social class to tell the next tale, but the miller will not have it. He's drunk, he interrupts, he insists that he should tell the next tale. <laughs> and he does. And he tells a brilliant tale. It's hilarious. It's packed with beautiful imagery. And it mocks and parodies the knight's tale and shows us things that the knight was doing that the knight maybe didn't fully realise. And then crucially, it's this is not an aberration. After that, we never go back to hierarchical order in the tales. It becomes this vibrant um, group where people will jump up and say, I want to tell the next tale. Sometimes the host will say, will you tell a tale? Sometimes someone will simply come in and, and re reply to, to the previous tale. There's debate. There's, in, there's all kinds of engagement. And I think that one of the things that Chaucer is really profoundly committed to is the idea of trying to think about perspective so that what you see depends on where you are standing, both literally and metaphorically. On his travels, you know, he saw early experiments in artistic perspective. And I think he was profoundly interested in moral and in literary and in aesthetic perspective in all kinds of ways. So if you only listen to stories told by people from one social class, you will only hear one kind of, of story in a way. You know, and he was saying, look, we have to listen to different points of view. We don't have to like it. We don't have to think they're all equally good we don't you know that's up to the reader or the listener what they think but you have to try you have to listen to different points of view you have to think about why does this person think in this sort of way and we can only really get a, a, a proper purchase on that by hearing different perspectives and different points of view and that really is the cornerstone of his of his art I think mm -hmm. I have a friend who studies Elizabethan poetry, and one of the things he points out is you probably have heard of some Elizabethan poets, but there are a lot of Elizabethan poets that you never heard of. Is that true of Chaucer? Did he have literary peers that have vanished in the, I hate to use this expression, miss of time? Did he have a context that we can reconstruct? Um, yes, absolutely. So there are some so, so Chaucer was writing at a time when quite a few poets started to write in the vernacular. So there were some who, you know, some people might have heard of. So people such as Langland, who wrote Piers Plowman, or the, yeah. the anonymous yeah. poet who wrote Sir Gawain and the Green Knights and Pearl and, and two other poems as well. Or John Gower, who wrote three very long poems, one in English, one in French, one in Latin. He was someone that, that Chaucer definitely knew and they, they referred to each other and, and are referred to together in, in documents. So there were poets such as those who whom we, we know about and who are still studied today. And there are other more obscure writers, um, some of whom I've mentioned briefly in the course of this, this interview, Thomas Usk, John Clanval, um, who wrote just a little bit, um, there were also, I mean, lots of, of anonymous, I mean, there are other named writers as well, of course. There are also lots of anonymous writers, people who wrote romances, for example, or short lyric poems whose names we, we don't know. Um, so he does have a poetic context, but most of his context, or much of it anyway, is, is not people who are writing in English because m his literary influences were really more people who were writing in, in other languages. Um, and a lot of the people that he knew personally as poets, particularly in his, in his young years, were people who were writing in French. And I think, you know, you know, such is the nature of the way that a lot of us 
read or are taught that we it, it's easy to to forget that that multilingual poetic environment that was was so fundamental in Chaucer's time. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, again, I'm sort of reminded of Keith Richards <laughs> because you know if you want to understand the early Rolling Stones, you have to listen to. American blues, but there were a lot of English guys who were also producing it that you, you, we don't know anything about them anymore. They're kind of forgotten. Um, I, I do want to ask about how Chaucer became Chaucer because uh, most educated people, let's put it that way, will know about Chaucer something, but they have forgotten all these other names. And I, I'd be interested in understanding how he, I don't know if people still say the canon anymore, but how he entered the canon and when. Yeah, no, that's a really interesting question. So in in the 15th and 16th century, so for a time, people used to talk about a, a triumvirate of um, medieval English poets, and they would talk about Chaucer, Gower, and Lydgate as three great poets, and no one really does that anymore because... <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know the other two, so yeah, it's... Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, but okay, so one thing that happens is that when Caxton sets up his print, his printing press um, later in the 15th century, Caxton tended to want to print things that were written in basically in London English, so in the East Midland dialect that Chaucer wrote in. So poems such as the absolutely brilliant Gawain and the Green Knight, which was written in a Northwestern dialect, was ignored, was not printed till I think the 19th century. You know, no one was interested in in printing those kinds of poems. So so Chaucer has an advantage at, at that point because he's writing in the he was writing in the dialect that became the language of bureaucracy and became standard English. Um, then he I mean he was always in fashion and partly of course it, I mean partly there is a, a sense of of that he deserves it. He, he is really good. And also he wrote so much. I think that's also something really important that he wrote such variety that people could, depending on what, what you like, you can always find something that you like in Chaucer. If you want a serious saint's life, you can find that. If you want a funny, bawdy fablio about people having sex in a tree, you can find that as well. Um, <laughs> literally. Um, so, yes. um, and in fact, we, we, we see, it's quite interesting if you look across time, you know, in the 15th century, the tales that were most often kind of copied out, you know, separately that people liked the most were often quite, kind of serious moral tales that in the 20th century no one liked at all you know in the 20th century everyone liked people farting out of the window and that kind of thing um so there's a choice for every age every generation that that kind of thing in the 16th century so the finn someone called finn printed a big edition of Chaucer's works and that was the first time that a vernacular poet was was given a work, so it was called the works of Geoffrey Chaucer, mm. and that was only had only ever been been done for for Latin writers. So, so right then in the 16th century, and you know, in the early 16th century, Chaucer was being praised and lauded then as the the founder of of the English yeah the, the English canon of English literature, and I think that I mean partly it is because although even then people were saying his language was was hard, but it's obviously recognisable in a way that earlier English was just more difficult. You know, it was a step too far for lots of people and still is a step too far for, yeah. for lots of people. But from then onwards, I mean, Chaucer was always you know, hugely, hugely influential, you know, massive influence on, on, on all our, on, on a huge number of writers anyway. So, so he's, so really from very early on, he is being praised as this, this father figure. Well, Marion, this has been absolutely fascinating. I've, I've learned a lot about Chaucer and I think people will learn a lot about Chaucer from reading your book. Let me ask the traditional final question on the New Books Network. And that is, what are you working on now? Well, I'm now writing a book about the wife of Bath. So, and I'm thinking about it as a biography of the wife of Bath across time. So the wife of Bath is Chaucer's most famous character and also his favourite character. And he put her into lots of different texts. She escaped from her own prologue and tale and into other Canterbury tales and even into one of Chaucer's short poems. And then, you know, across the centuries, she's escaped into lots of other texts as well. She's a, a kind of book runner. So this, so I'm trying to, so I'm writing this as a kind of experimental biography. You know, how can we write a biography of a literary character? So the first half of the book, thinks about the wife of Bath as really the first real character in English literature. 
and explores the the fact that Chaucer decides to write this character to make her into a relatively ordinary woman. You know, usually women in, in literature had been princesses or saints or nuns or evil enchantresses. But this is a middle class, middle aged working woman who has sex and goes on holiday and chats to her friends. You know, there's lots of things about this woman which we don't expect to see in literature at this time. So the first half of the book looks at where does she come from? What's the mix of literary sources and and what's going on in the contemporary historical moment that allows a figure like this to emerge because she is so extraordinary and unprecedented. And one of the big things that allows her to emerge is the post-plague environment because the plague was a demographic catastrophe that in fact had effects for women that were quite good in all kinds of ways. It created a lot more opportunities for women, particularly in some parts of Europe, in Northwestern Europe, lots of... um, Lots of better opportunities for sexual choices, for inheritance, for work, all those kinds of things. So I look at how she emerged then. And then in the second half of the book, I look at her across time. So I go from her 15th century scribes who tried to write all kinds of comments on the manuscript to put her back in her place. 16th and 17th century ballads. There were printers of ballads who were put in prison and had the ballads about the wife of Bath burnt, for example. I look at Voltaire's version of The Wife of Bath, at American early 20th century plays about The Wife of Bath, Pasolini's Mm. 1970s film version of The Canticle Tales, what he does with The Wife of Bath. And then I come right up to the present day. Um, Last year, Zadie Smith was supposed to, wrote a play about The Wife of Bath, which unfortunately has been delayed by the the pandemic, Mm. Um, but hopefully it will be performed later this year. But in recent years, in fact, lots of, Black female poets and writers have written new versions of The Wife of Bath. So I try to think about about why that is. Why is she still speaking to us so much in the in the present day? And so this is a book that will be out in in a couple of years again with Princeton. And you can interview me again about that. I will. Absolutely. Absolutely. I will. I also wanted to say that this is quite... um consistent with the zeitgeist, or at least one portion of it. One of the things I learned recently is that if you go to Wikipedia, there are entries on literary characters. Did you know that? Ah, <laughs> it's yeah, amazing. It's Completely fictional characters get Wikipedia entries. Really <laughs> I think you should write the one for the wife of Bath. <laughs> well, it's, it's really interesting just thinking about kind of what character is, isn't it? Because I think, you know, for a long time in literature departments, we were we were all kind of taught that we were supposed to despise character study, you know, that, that it's a very naive way of reading to think about character that you know people who don't really know how to read think about characters as real people oh, Actually, of course they're not they're just words on a page but in actual fact when we think i think more holistically about the reading experience we have to find something in between the idea of real people and just words on a page because there's something much more complicated going on with literary character and with the kind of responses that are engendered by our our connections with literary character I think you're absolutely right. And it's funny because sometimes I'll be watching something and I'll say, well, just to give an example recently, I'll say, oh, that's Candide. <laughs> Under another name. <laughs> and Candide probably had some predecessor that I don't even know about. Um, so anyway, well, yeah. Mary, yeah, absolutely fascinating talking to you. I, I really enjoyed our conversation. Uh, let me tell all the listeners that this is Marshall Poe. I'm the editor of the New Books Network. And today we've been talking to Marion Turner about her terrific book, Chaucer, A European Life, out from Princeton University Press. Marion, thank you for being on the show. Thank you so much. It's been a great pleasure. Absolutely. And thank you for everyone who listens to this podcast. And I hope that you turn in next time. 